suggest that within the next two months or so, Julian Assange will be released. Um, I know Anthony Albanese is working strongly behind the scenes. He has said as much, that enough is enough. The really, the, the compelling thing about that case is that the American military officer who leaked the information, Chelsea Manning, mm -hmm. to uh, Julian Assange, she is free. She was released. Get out your notebook. Welcome to CN Live, the premiere episode of season five, Saving Assange, Saving U.S. Face. I'm Joe Loria, the editor-in-chief of Consortium News. As Julian Assange awaits a decision by the High Court in London whether to accept his appeal against the Home Secretary's decision to extradite him to the United States, the focus of the story has shifted here to Australia, where the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, has said for the first time that he's discussed with the United States bringing Assange's ordeal to a close. A prominent television journalist here, John Lyons of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, shortly afterwards said he understood that Assange would be back home in Australia within two months. CN Live traveled to Hobart, the capital of the state of Tasmania, to discuss the latest developments in the Assange case with Christine Milne, a former senator in the federal parliament and head of the Australian Green Party, who has been a vocal advocate for the imprisoned WikiLeaks publisher, and with Greg Barnes, a senior counsel and advisor to the Assange campaign. Welcome to this special CN Live presentation from Hobart, Tasmania, Australia, the former leader of the Australian Green Party, Christine Milne. Christine, thank you for joining us on CN Live. We're going to speak to you mostly about Julian Assange, because you've been involved in his case for some time now. But first, since we are largely speaking to an American audience, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you began in politics and your rise to the leadership of the Green Party. Well, thank you for having me on the program. I am an environmentalist, lifelong environmentalist, and I became involved in Tasmanian politics back in the 1980s, trying to save the Franklin River in Tasmania, and then I got into politics running the campaign against the chlorine bleaching pulp mill at Wesley Vale. So that was in 1989. Since then, I've been involved in green politics, became the Tasmanian leader, then the Australian leader. I was also in that time on the Global Council of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And so my whole political career has been really involved in environmentalism, social justice, and participatory democracy, peace and non-violence. And how long were you a member of parliament in Canberra? I was in the federal parliament in the Senate for a decade. So I was elected in 2004 and I resigned in 2015. Why did you resign in 2015? The coalition, the Conservatives, had just been elected and it was very clear that we were going to go into a dark age of climate policy or climate denial. I was 62 at the time and I thought to myself, actually, I don't want to waste the next five years of my life fighting climate denial, so I'm better off outside politics and contributing through the environment movement, both nationally and globally. And you don't have any regrets since the last six years. It was a kind of dark age, wasn't it? it was terrible. The dark age was in America, in, in Australia, in fact, the Murdoch media drove that dark age in the UK, the US and Australia and also the Koch brothers through their think tanks in the US. It has been a terrible period for democracy, for social justice but particularly for the climate but we're gradually coming out of it now but we would be foolish to think that the corporations which have captured governments in those three countries, we'd be foolish to think that that state capture no longer exists. It still does. So there were other issues that you were dealing with in Palm in those 10 years. What were they? Well, in the first half of it, when I had balance of power with a Labor government, I managed to secure a carbon price in Australia. I secured the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, the Renewable Energy Agency, a parliamentary budget office. We worked hard on refugee issues because we were the only party in the parliament saying that it is not a crime to seek asylum. 
so it was a pretty dark period in politics, but we did get some big wins. After I left, uh, having campaigned for a long time for marriage equality, after I left, finally the country did get there. And I was pleased about that because right back in the 90s in Tasmania, it was my private member's bill that secured gay law reform and took us from the worst laws in the country to the best. So there have been some moves forward for groups struggling for recognition and against discrimination. Can you give me an assessment of the global green movement? There are green parties in many, many countries. Some do better than others electorally. Is it dislodged from its original principles of environmentalism? Has it gone astray in some way? Or how do you assess the health of the green political movement? Well, I'm an ambassador for the Global Greens now, and I'm very pleased to say that there are green parties in over 90 countries in the world, and it all started here in Tasmania. The world's first green party was the United Tasmania Group formed here in Tasmania to try to save Lake Pedder from a hydro impoundment. So it's extraordinary that that idea from 1972 has now become a global movement. The Greens are definitely strongest in Europe, where the Greens are in government in a shared power arrangement in at least six countries. Uh, probably the best known is, of course, in Germany, where they've had to struggle in recent times because of the war in Ukraine and, of course, the rise in dependence on gas. But the extraordinary thing is they've managed to get Germany virtually off gas as a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Well, the, the German Green Party in particular, with the foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, uh, has been a very vocal supporter of sending arms to Ukraine, of fighting this proxy war, one, one might say, against Russia. There are other Greens who disagree with that, like Joe Stein, the former head of the US. Yeah. How do you assess the German Green Party's stance on that issue? Well, I think the Greens across Europe um, have a range of opinions, but certainly the members of the European, the Green Bloc in the European Parliament are very supportive of that action that's been taken by the German, the position that's been taken by the German Greens. But there's a variety of opinion on that. But peace and non-violence is fundamental to where the Greens have come from as is um, environmentalism. And you've got Carolyn Lucas in the House of Commons in the UK doing a fantastic job. You've got Green Party in government, shared government in Ireland. Uh, Grace O'Sullivan is doing a fantastic job in the European Parliament. She is currently uh, in Greece, standing up for the people who have been assisting the asylum seekers and rescuing them and who are now facing criminal charges for compassion. Extraordinary the way the world is going. So um, we've got uh, a Green uh, elected, or two in fact, in Rwanda. So after the genocide, um, finally they had the elections and we've got a Green elected there. Um, so it's quite interesting. We've got the Minister for Climate in New Zealand as part of the government there uh, is Green. Um, in Finland, the Foreign Minister, Pekka Havista, is Green. So the influence of the Greens is quite widespread. Good. So back to Australia. Now, amongst the other issues that you were involved in was Julian Assange. <clears throat> you were saying that from the very earliest time you had an interest in his case, and in WikiLeaks. Tell us a little bit about how you got interested in WikiLeaks and Julian. Well, I was lucky because in the Green parliamentary team, we had a senator from Western Australia called Scott Ludlam. And Scott had been a friend of Julian Assange and uh, also his policy advisor, Felicity Ruby, was also a good friend of Julian Assange. So... Unlike others who perhaps just picked up bits and pieces coming through the news, they were very well informed on the issue and hence, uh, as the deputy leader and then the, le the leader of the Greens, they were able to keep me abreast of the case. And so from the earliest time, as soon as the whole, um, what I regard as almost global persecution of Assange started, the Greens in the Australian Parliament took a strong stand in favour of uh, press freedom and in favour of freeing Julian Assange. And um, 
what were some of the earliest issues about our surrounding Assange that you were personally involved in? Well, I can't really remember. It's quite a long time ago and there's <clears> been so much that's happened since. But certainly every rally that was held for Assange, then um, the Greens would be outspoken, supportive of, and the same in the Parliament. We asked questions, we raised debates in the Parliament and so on. What was evident, though, was that both the Coalition and the Labor Party were not having a bar of it. Uh, in fact, when I was in balance of power with Julia Gillard, the uh, Labor Prime Minister of Australia, uh, she came out and shockingly declared that what WikiLeaks and Assange had done were illegal. Now, that was outrageous. Uh, the federal police contradicted that, but nevertheless, she has never apologised nor taken a back step uh, from that position. Bob Carr, the Foreign Minister, was just as bad. And I remember a disgusting press conference and he thought he was so smart. He went out to say, in the face of criticism from the Greens, myself included, he went out and said, look, Australia has never given more consular support to any of our citizens overseas than has been given to Assange. He laughed about that afterwards and said, well, I didn't know if it was true or not, but how could you disprove it? Um, and it was absolutely disgraceful. Of course, since he left politics and his job no longer depends on it, he is now uh, a supporter of Assange and freedom of the press. But when he had the power to do something about it, he was totally in line with Gillard's rejection of Assange. And I don't think you can now see his position separate from where he was when he could have done something about it. So right back then, uh, we were questioning why the Australian government was doing what it was doing. And of course, then when the coalition was elected, and moving on to Scott Morrison, he had a very close relationship with uh, Pompeo. Uh, that relationship was based on them both being evangelical Christians. They supposedly um, had weekly, if not more uh, frequent than that, meetings, texts, and so on. And so there was no hope for Assange as long as we had an Australian Prime Minister so closely aligned to someone like Mike Pompeo. Did you have a clash with Gillard during question time in Parliament? I was in the Senate and uh, the Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, I was see. in the lower house, right. in the House of Representatives. And so, of course, our debates were directed to the, uh, the ministers in the upper house. So it wasn't a direct uh, conflict. But there was no movement, I have to say, from any of them on the front bench of either the Liberal or the Labor parties who were prepared to take a stand for Assange. And the, 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 the constant refrain was, we're giving him every consular support, you know. Um, but yet, other Australian citizens, whether they were in the Middle East or in Asia, held in various ways, there were very proactive and loud campaigns and ministers would say they had raised this issue with the foreign minister or raised it with the head of state, but with Assange, never. Give us a couple of examples of when they actually, Australian government got Australians out of captivity from various countries. So uh, I worked very hard to get Peter Grester out of Egypt extremely hard. I worked with his family, I worked with lawyers, I worked with the Greens in the European Union, for example. And the Greens in the European Union were quite influential in that campaign in the end to get Peter Grester freed. Uh, so that is one. And when he was freed, and this is when the coalition was in power and Julie Bishop was the foreign minister, she held a reception in the Prime Minister's suite at Parliament House for Peter Grester, for his family and for those politicians like myself who'd worked very hard to free Peter Grester. So that is the comparison where you have how they might treat one Australian journalist locked up in Egypt 
but they have absolutely zero intention of putting the same effort or the same profile on someone like Julian Assange. And clearly, it's all about the US-Australia alliance. It is all about the fact that Julian Assange has seriously exposed the war crimes of the US. He not only did that, but the documents that were released also provided information about the, uh, the coup that was um, not uh, in the true definition of the word, but the leadership spill um, that Gillard carried out against Rudd, the former Prime Minister in Australia, those documents were there and embarrassed her severely. So those, in my view, it has never been about freedom of the press for them. It is about revenge and about the alliance with the US to try to give the US whatever the US wants because Australia is the junior partner and it's embarrassing. Was Gillard Prime Minister when Grist was released from Egypt? No, it was the coalition because right. the Foreign Minister uh, was Julie Bishop, Bishop yeah. uh, and it was uh, 2015, so it was, I think, um, Abbott who was still the Prime what? Minister at that stage. What had happened to Gillard? She never withdrew her statement that it was illegal, even though the police said it wasn't. She, you're saying she was personally motivated to not help Julian Assange, uh, to oppose him because of what WikiLeaks revealed about her. So what happened to her after she left? Yeah, home? I think it was more than just what it revealed about her. I think she had a very uh, close relationship with Hillary Clinton. Uh, and I think she also had that relationship with Obama. And so she was very much of a view to supporting the US position, as well as what had happened to her. Uh, she knew in 2013 that she would lose the election uh, to Tony Abbott. And in the 2013 budget, the Australian government made a substantial, um, in fact, the biggest of any contributing country to the Global Education Foundation set up in Washington. And uh, she lost the election and was made the global chair of that foundation on the back of that major donation that the Australian government had made. And that was for a three-year term. To create uh, this organisation, this UN... No, the, the Global Education yeah. Foundation already existed. Okay. Uh, the Clinton Foundation was a partner to it. Uh, the Australian government made a substantial donation to be paid over three years and Julia Gillard became the chair of that organisation and then from there went on to um, have, a, I think, an emeritus position at Oxford. And then, of course, when the money ran out from the US, she came back to Australia. What is she doing now? She's an ambassador for Beyond Blue, the organisation to promote addressing mental health. She's landed on her feet. Sounds like politics as usual, doesn't it? It's a lot of politics as usual. There was a lot of planning ahead in that, I'd say. <laughs> hmm. Julia Gillard is not the only enemy that Julian Assange has in Australia. Why uh, has Australia not been so strongly supportive of him, even though there have been polls here, I think 60 Minutes here in Australia, at a poll where over 90% of Australians want him returned here, and yet you don't see any real political movement. Is it purely because they are intimidated by the US and you're playing a much lesser, even a vassal role, even with the United States? Well, I think Australia does play a vassal role, uh, you know, uh, with the United States. Uh, there is clearly um, uh, the big brother United States uh, mentality in Canberra. The notion of Australia being independent uh, has long gone. Uh, if it in fact was ever there, you know, I remember back to the Vietnam War with all the way with LBJ. Yeah, but then um, Gough came along, Gough Whitlam, and pulled and re out. and re-established, and then we have just slipped back into that. And the US and Australia now are in very close uh, defence arrangements. And in fact, it was Prime Minister Gillard who welcomed that new base in Darwin, where we have now many thousand uh, American troops. And just recently, of course, you had the AUKUS alliance. Uh, no discussion with the Australian community at all. Uh, just announced that we were in this new um, defence alliance. 
So in my view, it is all about Australia just doing for the US what the US wants. And the US wants Assange because he exposed uh, the crimes of the US and a lot of serious and Vault 7, a lot of other information about the US, which was embarrassing. And so they want to make sure that there is a, a chilling signal sent worldwide that you do not reveal what's going on in the US or you will suffer for life. And to me, that's exactly what's going on. And Australia has just gone along with it. There's now really no doubt that Gough Whitlam was removed in a coup uh, by Buckingham Palace, but also involvement of the US, particularly the CIA. You think that that still sends a message to Australian politicians today, particularly someone who is the prime minister, that if you go against the U.S. interests, you could lose your job and be overthrown? I think it's less of that and more of the, um, the hero worship, you know, the, the um, wanting to be aligned with the global power, the U.S. I, I really think it is more that. Um, so I think it's less fear and more just desperation, like me too, me too, I want to be there. Uh, when I was uh, the leader of the Greens, for example, and um, the US went back into the Middle East, the Prime Minister at the time, Tony Abbott, uh, kept saying, can Australia come? You know, we want to go, we want to go. And, and Australia was told, well, you have to be invited. And they're going, well, well, we need to be invited. We need to be invited. They just can't bear the idea that they're not going to be part of the action. And so it very much is what Pompeo wanted, Morrison was prepared to deliver. And now we have exactly the same thing. Biden had the opportunity to drop this whole case against Assange and he didn't. And Australia has been building this alliance with the US and feeding more and more troops, more and more dependence into it. And I just don't think Australia will do anything that offends Biden. They can ask, they can beg. As, I, as we are told, there's quiet diplomacy going on, whatever that means, begging, I suspect. Um, but there is no public call for Biden to respect an ally. You know, as an American, I can only ask why. Why is Australia so mesmerized by the power of the United States? Is it because of a really a psyop that the US government creates about it, its image in the world, which is quite different from the reality of its mm -hmm. behavior since the Second World War in particular, which Julian Assange helped reveal, which is why I think he's in the mess he's in. <clears throat> or is it uh, purely when Australians want to be part of an empire, essentially. I mean, once been part of the British Empire. They want to feel like they're participants in it somehow and, and vicariously feel that power. Well, Australia has always seen itself as a European country in Asia. Um, or And so uh, Keating tried hard, as in fact Goff had done before, to say, look, we are in Asia. We are now where the world is. The, the focus on Europe ought to be long gone because they are in decline. Asia is on the rise. We are an Asian country. But instead of that, there's this desperation of saying, well, we are an outpost, if you like, of Europe and the US, and we are brilliantly positioned in Asia, but actually our cultural connections are there. And now that we've become strategic, our location is strategically important, um, as it always has been, but even more so in the militarised view of the world that we've got right now, I just think that um, people uh, suddenly feel like they are part of a, um, a bigger picture global action and we're part of the action. That brings you to Kevin Rudd because, of course, he, a former prime minister, yeah very involved with China, knows the language, etc. ran the Asia Society yeah. in New York recently, and he's now been appointed the American ambassador, so the ambassador to the U.S., I should say. And many people who support Julian Assange are, are looking to him to have the kind of clout that even, even uh, Albanese, the prime minister, Anthony Albanese, would not have with the Americans. What do you see about his role in the issue of Julian Assange? Well, 
now that he's going to be in Washington? It's a good question. He has spoken out in favour of Assange. She's spoken out in favour of freedom of the press. He's a big critic of Murdoch, uh, post his prime ministership, I might say. Um, but I think he'll toe the government line. A lot of people are imagining he will take a more independent position, but he is the ambassador, and I think he recognises that he will. That that's the quid pro quo is that he'll toe the line. So I expect he will. But at least we know he is predisposed to speaking up in favour of Julian Assange, and that's better than where we've been before. Even though he once had executive power in Australia, he will know that his role now is to be simply to toe the government line on Assange. What is the government line on Assange? The government line on Assange is to say to the Australian people, don't worry, we're doing our best. We're giving him all this consular support. We're into quiet diplomacy behind the scenes. We really are talking to people and doing things. Meanwhile, when they have press conferences in Vietnam or somewhere, they're talking about Australians who are imprisoned there or in China. But Assange, no, it's quiet diplomacy. We couldn't possibly embarrass our friendly allies, the US and the UK. What are they actually doing? Well, who knows? Who knows what they're actually doing? Um, in opposition, uh, the current Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, said enough is enough. He has never said that he supports Assange. He's never said that he does not think um, that he ought not to have been put in this position. All he says is it's gone on for long enough. You know, it needs to come to an end. But that is a different thing from saying Julian Assange is innocent, I support freedom of the press, I am going to ask Joe, Bri uh, Joe Biden as a friendly ally to drop the, this whole extradition case. That has never been said. And so frankly I think it's a pretty weak position to say it's gone on long enough, it needs to come to an end without actually supporting the case or the cause so, or the person. So, frankly, I think as the pressure builds from Assange supporters in Australia and around the world, as the pressure builds on freedom of the press, as some of those large newspapers who have finally been embarrassed into coming out and taking a stand and saying he should be free, the pressure is building on the Prime Minister and I think that they are trying to take the temperature of the Australian community and the temperature of the US and they're trying to figure out a way to save face for the US and get Assange freed. My big worry is that they're going to try and stitch up some arrangement whereby Assange is extradited to the US and then Australia does some deal to try and get him to serve a sentence at home. But as I keep saying, that relies on him staying alive. And I think it is a highly dangerous game because the priority, again, is not Julian Assange. It is not freedom of the press. It's how to find a political deal that saves face for one of our major allies and satisfies an electoral, a growing electoral need and pressure to do something about Julian Assange. If that were to happen, he'd have to stay alive at least 10 years because it would have to be after even a Supreme Court, if yeah. he got that far, a decision in his case before Australia could even ask. And we, who knows what the government will be in 10 years? It could be another coalition government. Um, I saw Albanese's waiting for the cover of those newspapers coming out to be able to say, to go a little further, he'd been very vague, we're not going to use megaphone diplomacy. He left everyone in the dark about what he's actually doing in terms of uh, con contacting Julian Assange. I thought, uh, and I, I think I was wrong, but uh, when he first was sworn in as Prime Minister, the next day he was on a plane to Japan to meet uh, with Biden and the others, and he had leverage right then. And Biden was asking him to join this new economic union there mm. and, uh, and to continue with the Quad. And uh, is Assange important enough to a man like Albanese to actually say, okay, uh, Mr. Biden, Mr. President, you want uh, 
50,000 more troops here in Australia? Well, there's this Australian citizen right now in a jail in London I want to talk to you about. Would they leverage uh, something as important from the United States' point of view, which is what they really only want to use this country as mm. kind of an aircraft carrier for U.S. Mm. Uh, regional uh, ambitions, would they, uh, would, is that in Albanese to leverage uh, the military interests of the U.S. and Australia to get Assange home? I have seen no evidence that there is the commitment to do that, but I hope I'm wrong. I'm ho I hope I am wrong and I am constantly calling on the Prime Minister to use the leverage we have with the US in the alliance that we've got to pressure President Biden to drop the extradition charges, to, re to allow Julian Assange to be free, um, but uh, I wouldn't bet on it. You know, John Shipton, Julian Assange's father, has said uh, more than one occasion that this is a winning issue for an Australian politician. The population, as I mentioned before, wants him home. They support Julian Assange. Why, why isn't it an easy thing to do to come out and say, I want the char charges dropped, I want him home? That would help with Australian voters. Is American interests and, cow and sucking up to America more important than winning an election at home and getting votes at home? Not more important than winning an election, but I don't think the Assange issue on its own is a sufficient uh, campaign at the moment to, to make uh, an election pivot on. Uh, and I certainly think uh, sucking up to the US and not embarrassing the CIA and not embarrassing uh, Joe Biden is right up there in terms of where the Australian government priorities are. And it's extraordinary. Uh, Trump, of course, Donald Trump was the, it was under his administration of this indictment uh, against Assange was issued, uh, and the arrest was made, and it was seemingly very much motivated by Vault Seven, which embarrassed the CIA, and Pompeo yeah. had just taken over as CIA director when that happened. Of course, the indictment against Assange mentions nothing about Vault yeah. Seven. It mentions nothing about the DNC leaks. But from my perspective, and I wonder if you agree, Joe Biden's pressure from two very powerful forces not to drop this case. One being the CIA, for the reasons I just said, and the other is the Democratic National Committee. They are still hell-bent on the idea that it was, the, it was Julian Assange that gave the United States Donald Trump as president, uh, which is a huge stretch that completely exonerates everything Julian, uh, Hillary Clinton, Julia Gillard's friend. Uh, what kind of a candidate she was, what those documents revealed. And this is the interesting thing. They were true. The head of the DNC and four other people resigned when they came out. Why would they have resigned? If it were? No one ever has proven that what was written in there was true. Uh, so it was uh, the voters had a right to know what Hillary Clinton was doing. But I think those are the two pressures on Biden. Would you agree not to drop this case? The CIA and his own party, of which he's the titular head of. Oh yeah, I think both of those yeah. things are true. And in terms of the Australian government, you know, I tried to find out in the last few years exactly what the Australian government knew about the spying on Assange that was going on uh, in the embassy. And, you know, at what point were they alerted to it? What did they do about it? And so on. Nothing. You can never get anything out of anyone about what they knew who they've been talking to in the UK, uh, or indeed who they've been talking to in the US. So to me, it is it has never, for the government, both Liberal and Labor, the issue of freedom of the press, the issue of an Australian citizen wrongfully held and incarcerated overseas has never been as important as maintaining a good relationship with the US and not embarrassing the US. Well, Australian leaders must know that in 2010, when Joe Biden was vice president, he told the American television network, in fact, you can get it on YouTube, and yes. it's from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, ABC, showed this clip, and it's still available, where he was asked directly, can you indict Julian Assange? And Vice President Biden in 2010 said, no, not unless we could prove he actually stole the documents. If they were just handed to him as a journalist, then we can't do anything. And guess what? They did not. The Obama administration did not indict no. him because they couldn't prove that. Yeah, because they and, couldn't take on the First Amendment. 
that was the thing that they they knew that if they tried it would be a First Amendment issue which was a complete acceptance of the fact this was about freedom of the press and they had to then dream up the espionage um, part of the case which came with Pompeo uh, and Scott Morrison as Prime Minister here collaborating uh, with Pompeo and suddenly you had the espionage because that was the only basis on which they could try and sustain a case that wasn't a First Amendment case. And then you had all the lies um, from the fraudulent uh, fellow from Iceland, uh, Ziggy, and, um, and all of that. It, it's, there have been so many opportunities for the Australian government to come out and just lay it down to the Australian people as to what has gone on, but they haven't. Okay, so let's talk about what uh, has been talked, what's been in, on social media and in the media in the last couple of days here in Australia that there's, and he's going to be released in two months. This, uh, an ABC foreign car, uh, diplomatic correspondent, John Lyon, was on an interview program on the ABC uh, just around New Year's and he made predictions for 2023. Funny enough, if you go to the ABC website and you look at that clip, you only see a few things. He's talking about Iran and Afghanistan. But he did, in fact, also talk about Julian Assange, and someone put that up on Twitter. And he said that within two months, he believed he would be released. Now, what do you make of this? Well, I don't know what to make of it, because it seemed to fit with a pattern of softening up the community for something to happen for Assange. Because, first of all, we had had quiet diplomacy, quiet diplomacy, we're not talking about it. And then um, we had the newspapers coming out all of a sudden um, saying, actually, no, it's a freedom of the press issue, he should be freed. Then we had the Prime Minister say, oh, well, actually, I have raised it with the US in a fairly vague way, not specifically who he'd raised it with, but he had raised it with the US, which was a move away from the quiet diplomacy. And then you have a prominent ABC journalist saying, well, actually, he thinks he'll be released in two months. Now, it's quite a common political tactic to send someone out there to run something up the mast and then to see what the community reaction is before the government then actually does it. That happens all the time. So when I saw that, I thought, oh, well, that's interesting in the light of these other things that's happened. I wonder if they're just testing the waters to see what the reaction will be if they make this announcement. Uh, and so I think the jury's out on whether it was just a journalist shooting his mouth off uh, as a result of an overheard conversation or whatever else, or whether he actually knows something. Now, there were also rumours a couple of months previous that there was a plea bargain in the works for Julian Assange. That Julian would plead guilty to some minor uh, offence, he would then be sent to back to Australia, but probably under the condition he couldn't work again as WikiLeaks editor and uh, participate in his work, his life work. Would you know of Julian Assange? Would he ever agree to such a deal? I don't see why he would. He has sacrificed a large part of his life uh, because he believes in freedom of the press and he is making a very strong point and has suffered beyond anything we can think about for that principle. Pleading guilty to something he didn't do doesn't seem to me to be in his character. Unless he's reached a point where he knows his life uh, is very much in jeopardy. And he has a child, two children, and a wife now. Yeah. But I, I tend to agree with what you just said. Yeah. Look, I, I think he's uh, an extraordinary individual. He's suffered enormously. I think Stella is amazing. Um, the support that, that she's been able to give him and, of course, other people who support her. But I just can't imagine how terrible it would be to be locked up in Belmarsh, prison with the worst of the worst in the most appalling circumstances and he's doing it for a principle. He's doing it for a principle. Um, if he did agree to a plea bargain, I would be totally sympathetic to that because he suffered enough and he needs to get out and that's exactly how we got 
David Hicks home from the US from Guantanamo Bay and no one of course thought anything any of the worse for that just getting him out was what we wanted to do and getting Julian out is what I want to do too but I think I, I don't think it's in his character to agree to something in order to be a face saver for the US who have thrown the weight of a nation against him. Christine Milne, thank you very much for speaking with us on CN Live. Thank you. We're here in Hobart, Tasmania, Australia with Greg Barnes. Greg is a senior counselor. He's been an advisor to the Australian campaign for Julian Assange for the past 11 years. Greg, welcome to CN Live. Thank you for giving us your time. Thank you, Jack. So you've seen just about everything that's happened in the Julian Assange case from the beginning, the ups and the downs, and there's been several significant moments. But I, as we were chatting before we begin this interview, you said you indicated this is a very significant moment now, that something important could happen. What do you think is up right now? Well, I'm going on uh, the fact that you've got a new government in Australia elected last year headed by Anthony Albanese who's made a commitment to end the Assange case. He said it on a number of occasions. He made a very strident statement in the Australian Parliament just before Christmas uh, and said that he'd raised it with the Americans. Um, we also saw uh, John Lyons, who's a very, very senior Australian journalist, uh, make a statement around New Year in terms of predictions that he expected to see something happen in the first two months of this year. Uh, that was significant because, uh, generally speaking, and it would be the same in the United States, uh, when senior journalists make comments like that, they're gener generally speaking uh, well informed, and I know John well, and he's a very considered, informed journalist. So, you know, our view, I think, is that um, there's now greater momentum because you've got an Australian government that actually cares about this particular citizen uh, and you've got an Australian government that I think understands the leverage that it has because it is the United States' closest ally in this region and one of its closest allies globally. Now, he didn't just say something's happening. He said he'd be released within a minute. Well, he did. He did. And, and look, it was a strong statement. Uh, and as I say, I, I uh, respect and um, we respect John. Uh, and uh, let's see what happens. But uh, certainly um, that statement, what was significant about that statement was there was no pushback from the government. No one, you know, yeah. as you know, Joe, if a journalist makes a statement and the government violently disagrees, it'll come out and say, no, nope, that's just not right. Uh, and this is significant because Lyons is a very senior Australian journalist. It's not a cadet journalist making that comment. Uh, yeah. And the government didn't push back on it. Yeah, he heard something. Uh, in Canberra, whether it was as specific as in two months he'll be out, it remains to be seen. Albanese had previously refused to be more specific about whatever he was doing. He said uh, it was quiet to plums, he wouldn't use a megaphone, and that was it. And suddenly he came out and made that strong statement. Just a few days prior to that, the five newspapers that partnered with WikiLeaks in 2010 came out with a pretty strong statement of their own, saying the charges should be dropped. We're talking about Le Monde, Der Spiegel, uh, the Guardian, the yep. New York Times, uh, and uh, Paez in Spain. And it was only a few days after that Albanese made that remark. Do you think there was any related relation between the two? Was that political cover for him? Uh, look, it may it may have been. I, I think it's also the case that uh, uh, what he'd said previously in his early days as Prime Minister was that he, he didn't want to conduct diplomacy by megaphone. And I think people understand that, particularly the nature of the alliance between Australia and the United States. I think the point that he was making just prior to Christmas is that he's making progress uh, and that he was prepared to let Australian people know, as he should, uh, that he had in fact raised it with the Americans. Uh, right. Now, uh, that is significant in the sense that Australian governments often say, and governments around the world often say, oh, well, we're making overtures to a foreign government. Here he was quite explicit. Um, I also suspect uh, that uh, the... Biden administration is much closer to this government than it was the previous Conservative government in Australia, and mm -hmm. the relations are certainly better, uh, and uh, it would have more in common with this uh, government, uh, and I think it takes this government seriously. Now, you mentioned the word leverage before, which I wanted to focus on. What leverage does Australia have? The United States needs things from Australia. Yeah, I mean, Australia... They want to send troops here. They want you on board with their China policy, absolutely. which is not necessarily in Australia's interest at all. But yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So what is Australia... What could he... How important is Assange to Albanese, to this government, that uh, how far would they go? And 
especially with the Canterbury military issues, were they actually involved well, in that? I mean, I can only, we, we can work off a precedent here, which was David Hicks. Um, David Hicks, uh, for your uh, listeners and viewers, was an Australian citizen who found himself in Guantanamo Bay as a result of alleged activities uh, in theatres of war prior to that. Uh, he, there was tremendous pressure that came on the then conservative government of John Howard in Australia. And uh, Hicks came back to Australia. Was, was removed from Guantanamo Bay by the Bush administration came back to Australia. It has happened uh, and it can happen. It happened in that case partly because uh, Bush regarded Howard as being one of his key allies in, in the war on terror along with, along with Tony Blair. In the case of Biden and Albanese, the dynamic is different but equally close. Uh, as you rightly say, uh, this is the key ally in the region, in the Asia-Pacific region, particularly in relation to the issues with China. Australia is now part of the new AUKUS Pact. Um, it's, of course, a key member of the Five Eyes. So, and, and in my discussions with uh, certainly uh, at least one former Australian foreign minister, uh, Australia does have cachet and leverage in Washington because it seemed to be such a reliable ally and a close ally. And that, in fact, does give you leverage when you really want something. Well, would Australia withhold something that the US wants in exchange? Let's face it, Hicks is not Assange. No. The United States won Assange a lot more than David Hicks. Yeah. He was expendable. I don't see Assange as being expendable. Yeah. Well, uh, look, I, I think I don't want to speculate on that. Uh, I don't think it's helpful to speculate on it. I don't want to speculate on it. But what, what I will say is that um, this Australian government, um, the Albanese government, appears to have a very good relationship. Uh, with uh, its US counterparts uh, and uh, one senses that there's more in common between Biden, the Biden administration and this administration. Both of them are from political parties that are mm -hmm. purportedly on the uh, sort of centre-left uh, in terms of the political landscape um, and certainly Albanese um, is a person who I think would be uh, and probably is uh, taken seriously in Washington. Uh, the United States would obviously want something in return. They're not just going to let them drop the case tomorrow, I don't believe. Uh, this, certainly, uh, there's pressure on Biden not to drop this case. Now, it's not as serious as Pompeo talking about even assassinating or kidnapping Julian Assange. However, even though he was not charged in the indictment with the D Democratic National Committee uh, emails that were published by WikiLeaks, nor Vault 7, the Vault 7 embarrassed the CIA, which led to Pompeo doing that, and the Democratic Party still blames Julian Assange for the election of Donald Trump. And those, for Joe Biden as the titular head of the Democratic Party, to say tomorrow I'm going to drop the charges against Julian Assange, I think would anger the DNC and the CIA. So he needs something in return. And there was, in my, what I've heard uh, two months or so, is that there was discussion of a possible plea bargain. So if the U.S. were to drop the charges, they would have to have, some, I think, some kind of a deal with Julian Assange in which he would no longer work. I think that might satisfy the CIA and the DNC. What have you heard about possible plea deals? Well, again, Joe, I don't want to speculate because uh, I think that uh, things are at a sensitive moment uh, in Australia. Uh, I, I hear what you say, but I think the key points in this case, though, are that there's a strong view on the part of many Australians that this is this case is about freedom of speech and it's about uh, an Australian citizen who exposed war, serious war crime activity by the United States and that we ought not be going after someone who does that. Secondly, I think there's pressure now from elements of the Australian media, including senior Australian journalists, to say, wow, this could be us next. Because what the United States is doing, as you know, is using extraterritorial reach to go after a person who's not an American citizen, who did not set foot in the United States, but simply published material that embarrassed the United States. The third point I, I, I'd make to you is that um, uh, th th this is a case where I think the expectation on the part of Australians is that the charges be, or the extradition request be withdrawn. Uh, and that Julian be allowed to return to his family. It needs to be remembered that he's now been effectively incarcerated for a period of, well, now coming into the 11th year, in conditions that have been horrific in the sense that 
uh, he was in the uh, Ecuadorian embassy with no fresh light, uh, sunlight for a number of years. He's been in the, the notorious Belmarsh prison, which is an awful place for any person to be in, let alone a person who's effectively on remand. And so in terms of punishment, it's done. It's been done. And so uh, our view, a yeah, very strong view, is that uh, this, this ought to be a case where the United States heeds the um, efforts of its uh, ally, close ally Australia, uh, and ensures that this matter comes to an end. I mean, that's what Albanese has said, that this matter should come to an end. He hasn't said, oh, look, let's go and negotiate and see if we can get an outcome here. He said this case must come to an end. That they're unambiguous words, and I think Australians rightly will be saying, yep, that's the right thing to do uh, for this Australian citizen. Well, uh, Assange has been effectively silenced since March of 2018 when the Ecuadorian government, the new government, shut off his internet. So until now, he's been silenced. He's not been a force, which is what upset clearly the Americans so much. So it, you won't speculate about a plea deal, but can you imagine him being free in Australia to continue his work one day? Well, I, I can in the sense that, uh, and I'll repeat what I've just said, that our very strong view in the Australian campaign's view is that this is an Australian citizen who has done no wrong, who's facing an effective death penalty for exercising his right to freedom of speech and for exposing the sort of activity that ought to be exposed. Um, and again, I don't want to speculate on, on the views of the Americans on that. I hear you and I, and I, I mean, this is all on the public record and what many people in the United States say. But equally, uh, as you know, Joe, there are many Americans who are very disturbed by uh, the mistreatment of and the persecution of Julian Assange. Particularly, I think, again, in light of the fact that, as you mentioned earlier, you know, you've had the so-called, you know, a nation which purports to uphold the rule of law, effectively saying, let's murder him. <laughs> One of its agencies saying, let, let, let's murder this one. It's, we'll call them assassination, but let's murder him. Um, and, 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 you know, you've had the, the spying on his, uh, on his lawyers, uh, on his meetings, extraordinary conduct. Uh, all of that in itself ought to be telling us that if, you, if, if you're serious about democracy, you say, this is unconscionable. This man uh, should be released immediately. Let him get on with the rest of his life. You know, you mentioned that uh, journalists in Australia might think that they're next. Uh, just a few weeks, I believe, after his arrest, Julian's arrest in uh, out of the Ecuadorian embassy in London, the, uh, the AFP, the Australian Federal Police, raided the offices of the ABC just a few weeks later. And John Lyon at that time was tweeting, live tweeting about this. Yeah. He was very strongly opposed Great. to that happening. Yeah. Now, he's not necessarily the most... Uh, Critical of Western policy. I heard the rest of his interview. He's very good on the Israel issue. Okay. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm but, his book is. But he knows this. He knows this. Um, yeah. Now, John. John is. Issue. Well, yeah, what's absolutely. at stake here? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely right. And 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 you're right about uh, John uh, understanding that uh, inherently. Uh, and you know, other Australian journalists of some note, Tony Walker, for example, former. Uh, foreign correspondent for the Financial Times, and in fact, I think the biographer of Yasser Arafat uh, is also acutely aware of it and has written about it. What's been happening, I think, with Australian journalists, it's been a slow burn issue. They've realised, uh, Joe, that, you know, what's at stake when you start reporting on security matters and, and what happens in theatres of war is that the security establishment will come after you. Uh, and they will come after you in ways that you wouldn't have imagined. And you're right. So, again, for those listening to this and watching this interview, uh, Australian journalists were raided uh, after uh, there'd been a publication of stories about alleged war crimes in Afghanistan. There was also another uh, Australian journalist, uh, I think from News Limited, who was, had her house raided. Same day. Inc yeah, day before, including yeah. with police going through her underwear drawer. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so I think Australian journalists who mightn't previously have really thought much about the Assange case or been that sympathetic say, well, we get it. We actually get it. What we're finding now is that um, whilst previously uh, some Australian journalists, as I say, were somewhat hostile to Assange, they got hung up on this issue, is he a journalist, is he not a journalist, which of course is irrelevant. Uh, we, did, we are finding now, though, 
many, many Australian journalists who are now not only signing petitions supporting Assange, I've had many who've contacted me to say they've done that, but also understanding what's at stake here in terms of journalism. And I think the significance of the five leading, you know, these are five leading newspapers in the world uh, coming together, uh, I think, again, brings home the fragility of freedom of speech and, and uh, the fragility of uh, journalists uh, operating in the current uh, atmosphere. I just had a supplementary question about Dan Oakes, who was also involved, yeah. the ABC journalist. Yeah, yeah. The Commonwealth Direction of Public Prosecutions advised the AFP that it is not in the public interest yeah. to charge journalists, to prosecute journalists. Does that set a precedent for Australia that distinguishes us from the United States and the UK? Well, uh, potentially. I think, Cathy, I, um, that was a decision taken by a particular DPP, a correct decision. But, of course, it, do, it won't stop the AFP going after journalists again. Mm. I, I mean, all, all what happened was the DPP did the right thing. It said, well, well, there's no public interest in this. In fact, it's dangerous to democracy to do it. They won't stop the AFP. I mean, you, you, you know, there's, a, there's, an, there's an antipathy between... I mean, I know this is as a, as a senior criminal defence lawyer. There's an antipathy between the police uh, and the media, except... <laughs> when the police use the media for their own purposes, which they do. But uh, I'm not confident that, uh, particularly in the absence of a strong Bill of Rights in this country, I'm not confident that we won't see further attempts to prosecute journalists. We should add that David McBride was the whistleblower in the ABC Correct. case, and he's not out of the woods. No, he's not. Legal. No, he's not. No, he's still not. going after him. Uh, yeah, the five newspapers and the New York Times in particular may have this, may have some effect on the U.S. government's thinking in this case, as you're saying... Uh, the journals here are putting pressure perhaps on the Australian government. My final question, Greg, and I thank you for your time, is you know Julian Assange? Uh, you know how committed he is to his work? He knew that this could happen to him way back in 2010. He said in an American TV interview. He knew what was happening. They knew that going to Sweden could result in him being extradited to the United States. So here he is now. He's got a wife. He's got children. He has a life that's in danger. It's in jeopardy. And yet from what I know of him, he would not very easily give up the right to work, to do his work. That's why he's in prison, because of his work. He was willing to risk that. So knowing him as you know him, would he put his life and his family ahead of working again? If the terms were, you can go free or you can serve a short sentence in Australia, but you can never work again in publications, in journalism, uh, in well, that's a choice he shouldn't. He, he should never have to make. No person should have to make that choice when they're doing that sort of work. Uh, and uh, Julian Assange, uh, in our view, has done more than enough time. Uh, uh, in fact, he shouldn't have done it any time at all. But he's done more than enough time, and that's not a choice that needs to be made or should be made. Greg Barnes, thank you very much for joining us on CN Live today. Thanks. Get out your notebook. If you are a consumer of independent news, then the first place you should be going to is Consortium News. And please do try to support them when you can. It doesn't have its articles behind a paywall. It's free for everyone. It's one of the best news sites out there. And it's been in the business of independent journalism and adversarial independent journalism for over two decades. I hope that with the public's continuing support of Consortium News, it will continue for a very long time to come. Thank you so much.